I don't know how can I pass a message in eight minutes, but let's try, you know. Uh, well, uh, I'm sh pretty sure much of you uh, are aware or uh, know Al Gore in his very famous uh, film that was launched, The Unconvenient Truth, followed by the book. No. Uh, I would start saying carbon is a very convenient abstraction. Uh, if we think what we have done since 1992, since the conference in Rio, uh, we humans have shaped a very unique framework, a global climate regime. We have our governments, our diplomats, and uh, specialized people have sat together during many, many years, backed by science, and we now, from 2020 on, that's when the Paris Agreement is full on force, we will have international climate governance. But how this can be achieved? Have you ever thought what kind of entity is climate? Are humans capable or have the power is within our hands to govern climate? How power is going to be exerted by humans over nature? I think those are the essential questions that we made uh, we usually don't bring to the forefront. So uh, under Paris Agreement, three important things have been fusioned together. The first is global climate legislation. All governments around the world are actually applying a template to make a homogeneous framework so we can compare who is fulfilling their obligations. The entire development agenda that was once development, then sustainable development, is now low carbon development. And very important, the finance for development agenda is also embedded in the climate. So I want to argue here that this is not only a big threat to localization, but a big threat to climate itself. You know? uh, the entire framework has been hijacked by not only corporations, but by this neoliberal mind, this neoliberal way of thinking that some even call the neoliberal rationality that is based on accounting, this accounting framework that everything can be reduced to a balance sheet. This idea that commerce rules everything. It's not by coincidence that this was a, it's an old magazine official from UNEP but put a price on carbon. No? Uh, and the, the back side of the, the magazine that I don't have the, the photo here says, you cannot treasure what you cannot measure. So carbon metrics uh, has, been, has become a new global way of, uh, for us to refer not only to our uh, current reality, I'm sure everybody here talks about emissions, carbons, and has, is becoming acquaint, acquainted as we are with calories. Everybody here knows that you can buy anything in a supermarket and you have the label that says the calories. But what do calories tell you about nutrition, about the food you are eating, about the land where it was produced, about the social relations, about maybe the peasants that were evicted to Nestlé to grow that food or for Kargi and Bunji. What kind of seed was used? So you turn calories visible, and we, are, we all know about empty calories, uh, but we turn many, many other things invisible. And calories can only be understood by all of us, no, understandable by all of us, because we have invented at some point in history the metric system. No? Only the British and the US have not adopted the, the, the metric system so far. And I think it's pretty emblematic of how you shape empires and who have to acquire the rules of the empires and who make the rules. No, the metric system is, is a too long story to tell here, but it was an enterprise of the French and was crucial as a demand from the French Revolution itself to unify weights and measures and to push, a def decisive push to global trade. Okay, but back to my, to my point in climate here. Uh, how then the climate policy shaped around carbon uh, is making all this evil, you know, and, and, and setting all this green feature. Not only 
in the entire agreement, our tra the trade structure is embedded because uh, I, I'm not sure who knows, but all the international maritime and air uh, transportation, the emissions from this are not accounted by any country. Just think of all those vessels with all kinds of commodities from China to everywhere, uh, from mining with soy, with oil, with liquefied gas. Those emissions are nobody's emission because one of the key assumptions of the climate policy is that you cannot harm trade. Mostly that trade is essentially to fight climate change. You know? But for me the worst is that the entire climate policy is transforming climate itself into a commodity. Uh, in the early days of the Marrakesh agreements, when people realized what international property rights over the intangibles were, we said we are entering in the moment where capitalism is going over the intangible, the commodification of the intangibles. So this means not only what you have and you cannot touch, but also to bring all what, it's, what is called natural capital into the market. So you need to commodify carbon, biodiversity, water, ecosystem services. All of those are now part of wild schemes of trade, of offset, of financialization, and of subprimes too. Uh, can we have the second one? The second picture? Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's move to what's going on inside the negotiations. Countries um, have to draw the national determined contribution. Uh, I don't know who is involved with climate policy, but then you list what you are going to do in terms of land, agriculture, forestry, renewable energy, infrastructure, transportation, and more lately, education, health, housing, etc. Uh, from inside the negotiations, people call the, those plans business plans. They say that this is the dreamland of all investors because instead of going to the countries and looking where I can buy and why I can have investment opportunities to generate profits, I just have portfolios of public policies offered in a hub in the United Nations website. This fits really well to a moment in history where the nation state is broke there's no more money to finance the public, and then we need to bring corporations in. So this is a key movement to legitimize corporate governance everywhere. They are becoming key partners for social and environmental actions everywhere. Uh, this such so-called coherent you know, framework for governing the climate some more enthusiastic officials, like I've heard from Rachel Kite, that was vice president of the World Bank, and uh, now it's uh, the climate envoy for the World Bank working in, in renewable energy initiative. She once said, you know, very sweaty, very, you know, annoyed in Lima in 2014, stop with all this, you know, we know what we are doing here, like being very frank in a closed meeting. We are, this is not about climate. We are re-engineering the world economy. This has been never done before in a coherent and, you know, aligned way. This is the kind of quote, you know, that you keep hearing when we are, we, you are really inside listening to what they are saying. So this coherent framework for governing climate uh, uh, it's pretty much what we know as the fourth industrial revolution, the digitalization of the entire productive and financial system. So what people talk about inside the climate talks, it's internet of things, artificial intelligence, intelligence the so-called next generation governance package with smart contracts, with drones, with satellites, with blockchains, with sensors everywhere. And how you make all the countries buy this apparatus, this gigantic apparatus of surveillance and control. You, can ha you have to monitor carbon. And the only way to monitor something that you cannot touch, you cannot smell, you cannot feel, is through digital governance. So I, my time is already up. Oh, I'm so sorry. So just the last one. <laughs> No, I have so many things. So just one like, uh, uh, and then how you translate that. For example, you can brand health 
no, and the show of horrors on climate, you can brand health as a climate change issue. Until 2014, we didn't discuss health within climate negotiations. But then the lobby was very strong, and by 2017, we have this whole chapter promoting that people should buy, with climate money, uh, contracts for vaccine, vaccines, vaccines for uh, the coming crisis of malaria, dengue, chikungunya, and all kinds of tropical disease, and Ford's, uh, Gates Foundation is pretty much pushing this forward. No? You also have the agenda item on loss and damage, that is the agenda of the reinsurance companies like Allianz and Swiss Re, that want to insure entire sectors of countries, like agricultural policy in Kenya for three years, but then to have the right to receive the insurance in case of a climate catastrophe, you have to follow all the rules, you have to obey, you have to buy hybrid seeds, you have to use the pesticides. Then you have education with UNESCO, who made in 17 languages this booklet about a rhino and its friends, how the animals and children fight climate change, and there is a lot of like consumer options, and at the end they say, there's nothing more we can do, now we need to bake some cupcakes, sell and buy carbon credits. And then the other animals say, where are you going to buy carbon credits? In a jungle South America somewhere. So the land is being targeted in the name of carbon to access the last pieces of earth that are not under private property. I could go on and tell many other things, but I just wanted to end uh, with this image about what is, what is at stake when I say that carbon abstractions, you know, we are incurring in epistemicide. When we learn to see the world through the lens and to the measure of carbon, we are excluding and systematically eradicating from the face of Earth all different kinds of knowledge that could help us in this crucial moment to, to go through this, in this crisis and find a different future for us. But the traditional knowledge and the way our mind has been shaping and how this is retro-shaping our mind all the day is a key dimension that we need to address. You know.